This slide shows a parable of how I think we, you know, a vision of how we may end up using this technology in the future. A person brought his very sick dog to the vet, who, and the veterinarian made a bad call to say, let's just wait and see. And the dog would not be here today had he listened. In the meanwhile, he provided the blood test, like the full medical records, to GPT-4, which said, I am not a vet, you need to talk to a professional, here are some hypotheses. He brought that information to a second vet who used it to save the dog's life. This story, I think, shows that the human with a medical professional and with ChatGPT as a brainstorming partner was able to achieve an outcome that would not have happened otherwise. I think this is something we should all reflect on, think about as we consider how to integrate these systems into our world. That was OpenAI co-founder Greg Brockman just a couple of days ago at the annual TED conference right here in Vancouver, Canada sharing some of the latest advances in OpenAI's GPT-4 artificial intelligence model, arguably the most advanced deep learning neural network in the world. Welcome to Futurescape. My name is Kirthi Roberts and I'm the producer of the show where we discuss innovations, possibilities and probable realities, seemingly good or bad, of the future today. In this video, I will capture some of the highlights from the TED conference in Vancouver last week and share with you arguments made in favor of and against advancements in artificial intelligence. Starting with the arguments in favor, in addition to the story of how artificial intelligence saved the life of Sassy's dog, OpenAI co-founder Greg Brockman shared a number of mind-blowing new plugins not yet publicly released that demonstrated the power of this technology. For instance, Brockman asked the AI to suggest a post-conference meal and to generate a picture of it. Here the AI is carrying out the task. The AI is also reporting back to him where it is in the process and what exactly it is doing. Here it has completed the first task and also generated an image of the exact meal it proposed for his viewing. Next, he asks the future version of GPT-4 to put together a shopping list for the ingredients and to tweet it out to all the TED viewers out there in real time. The point he's trying to make is that in the future, ChatGPT will require less and less instruction and will figure out exactly what apps to use to carry out the instructions, whether it is Instacart or an image database like DALI2 or Twitter or what have you, on its own. That is exactly what he is trying to demonstrate, which is completely a new way to think about the user interface. So here's the Instacart list it produced, but it is not just a simple list. All the items have been selected and put in his cart, and all he has to do is to adjust the quantities, if needed, and then proceed to pay. And here's the tweet that the AI has already drafted for him, and all he has to do is to review and send it. In the next example, he showed how, even when you don't know what you want, in the future, ChatGPT can try to infer what you might be looking for and guide you in your own query. For example, here he has a large data set of about 167,000 papers published in AI over the past 30 years and doesn't know where to begin the analysis. But he uploads the file and enables the AI to go off and work with Python, a versatile programming and scripting language commonly used by data scientists and engineers alike, and simply puts in a very generic request, and voila. It analyzes all the data in a split second and proposes a number of different visualizations, such as graphs with the number of authors per paper, the number of papers published per year, and a word cloud from all the titles in the paper. What he's trying to demonstrate here is how in the future, with zero programming skills, you can have the power of data science right at your fingertips. There were a couple of other examples he made, but the main point he was trying to drive home was about the future of human and machine collaboration and interaction, and how going forward, we're gonna have to rethink almost every aspect of how we interact with our personal computers or connected devices. Now, no story is really complete without telling or recognizing the flip side of it. 
For starters, I suspect most of you have already heard about the open letter to pause all AI activity on AI systems more powerful than GPT-4, signed by some of the most prominent minds working to advance artificial intelligence today. For what it's worth, I decided to show my support by signing and joining these groups of concerned citizens as well. I personally don't believe that AI development will slow down globally, but I believe it's an important point to make. And just maybe more voices will emerge as more people realize that this may not be just a double-edged sword, but a sword that might help land humans for the first time on the list of species at risk. In direct contrast to Greg Brockman's more positive take on artificial intelligence, Eliezer Yudkovsky, the founder of the Miri Institute or the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, which is a Berkeley, California-based think tank and not-for-profit organization, takes a very strong position against artificial intelligence. And while he respects anyone who signed the open letter, he believes that signing it understates the seriousness of the situation and is asking for too little in order to tackle this problem. His primary argument is that the most likely outcome is AI that does not do what we want and does not care for us, nor for sentient life in general. He believes that that kind of caring is something that could, in principle, be imbued into AI, but that we are not ready and do not currently know how. He believes the likely result of humanity facing down an opposed superhuman intelligence is a complete and total loss, to the humans of course, and compares it to a 10-year-old trying to play chess against Stockfish 15, the most advanced chess engine on the planet, or to the 11th century trying to fight the 21st century, or to Australopithecus, our ancestors, trying to pick a fight with Homo sapiens. His article published in the Time magazine not my favorite source by any means, is an interesting read and is likely to resonate with you depending on which camp you find yourself in. The pro-AI camp of Greg Brockman and OpenAI or the Miri and anti-AI camp of Eliezer Yudkovsky. Or perhaps a camp somewhere in between, like Gary Marcus, professor of psychology and neuroscience at NYU or New York University, who was concerned about misinformation and the threat for democracies worldwide, but appears cautiously optimistic and argues for an international regulatory body on AI, and that we need to integrate the power of AI systems like ChatGPT with more trustworthy and logic-based systems. My closing point is as follows. There is a lot for all humans to think about, and we understand very little of any of this, expert or non-expert alike, and regardless of which camp we find ourselves in today. Those crying wolf, like everyone who signed the open letter to pause the development of more powerful AI systems, are those who've taken more extreme positions to shut it all down, maybe in the minority. I suspect most people may not have had the time to contemplate this all, given how recent and rapid the commercial level or mass deployment of these initial AI systems have been, not even six months. While the optimist and engineer in me would like to believe in the possibilities and the benefits this technology may bring to this world, the realist in me is a little less positive and is concerned about our collective ability to tackle the challenge that artificial intelligence poses to humanity. If this is a book, We've barely written the first page of chapter one, and no amount of GPU power or the most advanced neural networks can predict the next page or the chapter to be written. And whether we muddle along, but get to complete all chapters of this book and live to tell the story, or if this book ends abruptly, unfortunately at this time, is anyone's guess. So that's it folks for this episode of Futurescape. Thanks for watching, and if you got value, Please like and subscribe, and please let me know your thoughts and comments right below. Until next time, be safe and be well.